So without further ado, I'm so thrilled and so honored. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ashley Farmer, Associate Professor in the Departments of History and African and African Diaspora Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She is the author of Remaking Black Power, How Black Women Transformed an Era, and her upcoming book is Queen Mother Audley Moore, Mother of Black Nationalism. Dr. Farmer, I'm so grateful to you for being here, for being in conversation with us, and I can't wait for all that we will learn together. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I think it might just be a little low. Oh, okay. I'm trying to get on your headphones, so I may need to take them out. Is that better, or should I? Yes. Okay. Sounds okay. amazing. Thank you. Thanks for checking. So we're going to jump right in with our first question. Uh, one thing that I love about your work, there are many things that I love about your work, but I'll, I'll pinpoint uh, my heart's work is really around storytelling for social justice. And you talk about the importance of narrative in your teaching. And so in your talk at the National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute last August, you said, everything is a story. And asking them, students, what narratives do you know? Why are textbooks this way? And more, most importantly, who is invested in you learning a history only this way? Who does that serve? And then also, what histories do you want to tell? I love those questions so, so much. So can you tell us more about what you mean? Why are narratives important? And what are narratives shaped by? So, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I am a reality TV lover and <laughs> unabashedly there, there's, there's no brow too low for me. Um, but I enter with that because I think it helps people understand. I like it because it crafts a good story, right? It's riveting. I know that it's not always true. It is in ways some kind of like fictionalized, you know, semi-reality, et cetera. But what it is, is kind of a template for how we show up culturally, how we show up economically, how we show up politically, et cetera, right? Um, and I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by the narratives that we choose to tell culturally. And what's really amazing, I think, about history in general is that that's exactly what it is, a set of collective stories we tell each other about who we are, how much money we make, how we identify, who's in power, right? Who's cool, who's not cool, et cetera. Um, and so I became a historian because I, I wanted to tell those stories, but also I realized that just like with reality TV, a lot of those narratives are fake or being, you know, spun in a way to make me believe a set of things, right? You know, when you see something on TV and then when you learn the true story, I mean, I think Jean's um, story of Rosa Parks is really wonderful case in point of that, right? About the narratives that we have and why that works. Um, so anyway, I, I think that it's really valuable to think about what are we collectively invested in, who are we collectively invested in, and who benefits from that collective investment. Um, and so if we think of history as just a set of collective investments and stories we tell each other about the past, um, then we can start to think about whether or not um, those are the stories that really are true to what happened. Um, and usually the truth is pretty juicy, so there's no need to cut a paper over it. <laughs> uh, that's why I always tell my students. Um, but also um, that some narratives hurt people, right? And we see the real effects of that. I mean, to take my reality TV narrative or uh, kind of analogy a little bit further, you know, once you know a certain set of people start to get stereotyped a certain way on TV, that really affects how people who look like them, act like them, live in that area, then live their lives, right? And history does the same thing. Um, so I'm just really invested in thinking about how we collectively think about the past and how we can do that. I will also add that I think um, narratives are so ingrained, they're such a key part of like our cultural work um, that we kind of start to blindly accept them. So one of the things that I think is really good about just naming them as that and perhaps helping students deconstruct them is it also just develops their critical thinking skills, right? It starts to make you think like everything around you isn't a given. Every story that you're being told isn't necessarily the truth because it's being written in a textbook. And I kind of feel like once they start to break those things down, you get different kind of race, glass, and gender glasses, which which they see everything. And sometimes they even come back to me and tell me they see reality TV differently. So it comes full circle. <laughs> 
I love that so much because one thing that you are pinpointing for us is examining power and how power shows up in the story and who ultimately gets to share the story, who gets to distort, who gets to erase the stories and really honing in on what that does to the narrative and ultimately how those narrative shapes beliefs and values and actions and whether or not we uphold or dismantle the status quo. So we're going to be getting into a lot of storytelling today because you have so many rich stories in your book and just in your work overall. But before we get to the life of Queen Mother Audley Moore in particular, I would love to hear, can you tell us about your decision to focus on the lives of revolutionary Black women? So, um, you know, I think that one of the things that I love about the women that I study or admire so much about the women that I study is their political imagination. Um, you know, I, I like I think a lot of people look around and feel very frustrated um, with the way things are. But just kind of like when we were talking about the narratives, um, sometimes you don't know what new narrative to make um, and what could be. And one of the things that I have found that the women that I study do particularly well is offer really great ideas and understandings of freedom dreams, right? They have really expansive political imaginations. Why do they have them? Because they're at the bottom of the totem pole, right? They are the people that are most affected by race, class, gender, sexuality constraints. And so you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by imagining a totally kind of upending or reordering of the current systems that we live in. Um, and so are some of their stories or ideas about how we should do things, do they seem far-fetched? Yes, otherwise they wouldn't be radical or revolutionary, right? Um, but I think they offer us a compass, um, a way to point our, our intentionality, a way to move with purpose together. And while we may not always get there, when we have a compass towards where we want to go, um, we do, we create a different set of choices, right? And we create a different set of actions. Um, so I found just kind of as a collective of historical actors, their work is just really um, inspirational in terms of thinking about expanding my political imagination. Um, and so I think that's why I'm drawn to them over and over again. I appreciate that so much. And one of the things that I so appreciate about your work too is just the focusing on everyday Black women, everyday revolutionary Black women. And as you were talking about imagination, I was thinking about some of the work of yours that I've read. And you've talked about the importance of using visual sources like cartoons to teach some of these stories. Uh, and I think that that could be really advantageous too for our, our audience that is comprised of many educators. And so can you talk about how Black women have expressed their politics through art? And, and how does that relate to how we can rethink what intellectual production is and looks like in, in the stories that we tell? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm certainly interested in, in the organizing that Black women radicals and revolutionaries do, but I'm also really interested, like I said, in their thoughts, um, how, what, what, they, what they think their politics are, why their politics are this versus that, and how they try to convince others to, to get on board with these kind of radical imaginings that we're talking about. Um, but one of the things that we have to keep in mind when talking about Black women in particular is that kind of the forms and formats of intellectual production, the things that um, we might go to most often when we think of political thought, like a speech, a treatise, right, a law, we weren't able to do those things. We're still often not able to do those things. Those are just not the forms and formats that are available to us. So on the one hand, it can start to be a little bit difficult to kind of find what we might think of as evidence of Black women's political thought. But it also opens up our minds to different ideas of what political expression can look like. Um, so in the book, I read um, an, a woman named Alice Childress, who um, was a radical Black playwright. I read her satire about a maid who um, it's serialized, it goes in a black newspaper and she goes and works in a white woman's home then goes home every day and tells her friend Marge about it. And even though it's all fiction, through their interactions, you get a sense of the politics and how black women are moving in the world, right? Um, another example is the Black Panther Party newspaper. A lot of people don't know um, that women drew a lot of those um, initial drawings in addition to Emory Douglas. And they often featured women more often expressing politics. And if you think about, um, you know, what is more visually appealing, you know, 
and what kind of captures people in that people's imaginations really instantaneously, it is those beautiful mixed media drawings and figures that they made that also, um, you know, express a form of politics, right? By what the woman is wearing or what the woman is doing. So one of the things I really try to encourage myself to do and others to do is think about just a political expression and political imagination as being really, really expansive and found in a lot of different places. And I think that really opens up our minds to different understandings of historical sources. Absolutely. And as you talk about being interested in thoughts and political expression, as we know, uh, throughout history, these political expressions have been policed and surveilled. I think just recently, there was that piece that came out in the New York Times about how Aretha Franklin was surveilled by the FBI. And we have a, a lesson at the Zen Education Project called Subversive Stories from the Red Scare, uh, written by my comrade Ursula Wolf Roca. And so we'll place that in the chat box for you all. And one of the figures that I had learned about as being surveilled by the FBI was Josephine Baker. And so we're seeing how this political expression through art is being policed, is being surveilled, and, and just the, the resistance. So how extensively were the women you studied tracked by the FBI? And what does that tell us about their role in history? Um, I love this question because it sits at kind of at the intersection of the work I'm doing and, you know, where I'm going. I'm thinking about writing about Black women in Pro next. Um, but um, through the counterintelligence program or Pro, uh, Black women were surveilled largely when it started in the 1950s all the way through really the late 70s. Um, so under the Freedom of Information Act, I'm able to get, you know, some of the records released, they're always heavily redacted. You never know if you got everything, but at least it offers us some record of how they were thinking about these black women. Um, and it's really actually an interesting subject because I think a lot of people know about say the King letter, right? Where Hoover and the agents try to get King to kill himself or people are really clear about the way Malcolm X was surveilled, but we don't talk a lot about the sustained kind of psychological and economic and political terror that Black women endured for sometimes decades, sometimes like in the case of Queen Mother Moore, from like the 20s to the 80s, right? A long time of day after day of surveillance. And so I think we have to ask ourselves a couple of things about that. Um, from the activist side, those of the women survived it, but at what cost? And how do we care for their stories and talk about their experiences with an ethic of care, but not let them get lost in the idea that state repression only happens to men, right? It just happens in different ways to women um, and sometimes the same ways. And then also too, what does it say that the government devoted so many resources to tracking these women for so long, right? Um, and how the, might that help us understand who they found to be political threats, right? Um, even if they weren't the same kind of major players and leaders in the movement that many of us know today. Oh, this is such critical history. And to think about the surveillance, and I also appreciate too the complexity and nuance that you're bringing up of the, of the ethic of care in being able to share these stories. So as we, we dive a little bit deeper into the storytelling, uh, let's take a deep dive into the life of Queen Mother Audley Moore. Um, but before we do that, we'd actually like to take a quick poll and see how folks are thinking about this work. So the question reads, before reading about this session, had you heard about Queen Mother Moore? And there is a second question of how have you taught about reparations? So the answers are yes, her name sounded familiar, but that's about it or no. And then have you taught about reparations? Yes, in depth. Yes, but only briefly, not, not yet, but I have plans to, and no, but I'm curious to learn more. So once we finish up with this poll, we'll post it, I'll give some what's coming up, and then we'll dive into a number of questions about Queen Mother oddly more. And I'll say too, one of the things that I found interesting about in reading your work, Dr. Farmers, you were talking about uh, how she was surveilled at, in her 80s. And so to think about this lifelong surveillance and what that means too, when we think about the care and, and the wellness and the well-being of a human, right, who's doing this resistive work. Um, yeah, what does that mean for history? I see people in the chat are excited for the deep dive. 
tell a little kind of tantalizing story about yes. her and surveillance while we are finishing up? Absolutely, okay. yes. So, you know, none of these women are dumb. And so, I mean, you know, I want you to imagine just like a car creeping behind you every day. And you're like, y'all aren't slick, right? Or I want you to imagine like um, somebody kind of calling up and prank calling your house to see if you live there, right? They're very clear about what the federal government is doing and the FBI agents, they know all the tricks. So at some point, um, they, they, they say um, she gets tired of them just calling up and acting a fool. So she says, fine, I'll come down and I'll come to the FBI office for an interview, right? So she's just like, I'm not even gonna hide what I'm doing not even gonna try to pretend it's not what I'm doing. And she goes in there and then they put the transcript of her conversation in the FBI file. And she's in there, she's causing a ruckus. She's asking them why they don't have any black agents. She's asking them what they do around there. She's asking them if they feel good about their lives, doing this to people. And so, you know, I, I also wanna emphasize that even though this is very harmful to do to someone, there were these moments where they, you know, just kind of called it what it is and learned to coexist with it and still didn't back down from their politics while doing it. And mm -hmm. people were very flustered by the fact of her coming in and like just boldly proclaiming. She was like, and what about it? <laughs> you know? I love that. And I, I appreciate that about her. She's like, stop calling me, stop following me. You know who I am, you know what I do. They did not stop, but I appreciate her kind of forthcomingness about that. Yes, I love that so much. That is the energy we need, right? To just show up and be like, what about it? <laughs> so I'm going to quickly read the poll results and then we'll do a, a deeper dive in. But it, it says, before reading about this session, had you heard about Queen Mother more? It looks like 67% of folks um, had not, 18, 15%, uh, excuse me, her name sounded familiar, but that's about it and then 18% said yes. So very exciting to dig into this history. And then have you taught about reparations? No, but I'm curious to learn more, 45%. Not yet, but I have plans to 14%. Yes, but only briefly 35% and yes, in depth 6%. So grateful for the folks that are here to do this learning, this collective learning together. So we just heard this incredible story but could you please tell us about Queen Mother Audley Moore and early 20th century radical or organizing? Let's let's take it back a little bit and think about how did she get started and why does this matter? Yeah, so um, what makes Queen Mother Moore's story so great is she lived from 1898 to 1997. So basically the entirety of the 20th century. And her last public appearance was in 1995 to give you a scope of kind of the breadth. And so you should think of her as kind of a traveler through every major moment in black radical or revolutionary politics. Um, she was born in 1898 in New Iberia, Louisiana, which is a small town outside of New Orleans, about two hours away. And she was actually born to this like really elite adult life. Like in her words that her whole family was planning on her being a bourgeois little stinker, right? Um, you know, she was primed to be among kind of the black elite. But it just so happened that both of her parents died when she was relatively young. And all of a sudden she kind of slid down the class ladder very quickly and had to take up work to, to take care of her siblings. So it's during this point, we're talking like 1918, 1919, so the early 20th century, um, that she meets a Jamaican sailor and he introduces her to Garveyism, to Marcus Garvey's UNIA, right? Um, and, and then um, New Orleans is a, is a Garveyite stronghold. And the story she tells that kind of radicalized her on the spot was, is that Garvey was coming to New Orleans, which is true. And he wanted to speak. And the white police officers were like, we're not having it because, you know, having a black nationalist come and rouse people, never a good idea for them, right? Um, I'm hearing that my audio is going in and out. Maybe I'll try to do this. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, hear. perfect. Um, and so um, she says the Garvey. I think your audio went out just a little bit again. Yeah, it looks like we can't hear you. I think it might have been better before. 
Yeah, it was just very occasionally dipping before, but now it's out altogether. Can I get a thumbs up or down as to whether you can hear me? Because I cannot hear you all. Oh, I can hear you okay. now. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, so she says that uh, Marcus Garvey comes back and the police are ready to arrest him. Everybody comes packing heat. She's got one in her bosom, one in her pocketbook, and they all jump up on the thing, on the, on the benches, and they pull out their guns like this, and they yell, speak, Garvey, speak, speak, Garvey, speak, in unison. And she says that the white police officers go out with the tail between their legs. Now, is this true? Possibly somewhat, right? But more importantly, what it is, is a story of her seeing Black self-defense and Black self-determination and action and relationship to Garvey. And she says she signs up for, Gar for the UNIA then and there. And she really is a lifelong Garveyite after that. Um, but she's also an emblematic of somebody that travels through the different spaces of Black radical politics in early 20th century. So she works and organizes with the UNIA. Um, but as you may know, Garvey's movement dissipates when he gets deported for mail fraud. And what's there to take its place? The Communist Party, right? Why is the Communist Party the go-to place for people like Audley Moore who are dyed in the wool Black nationalist? Well, in the late 1920s, they declare Black people are a nation in the Black Belt, right, and have the right to self-determination. They say we share an economic condition, a cultural plight, a political condition, a shared culture, right, the, 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 the kind of makeshift or the definitions of a nation. And they also defend the working class every day. When people are getting thrown out because they can't pay the rent, the Communist Party, the people that put them back in, right? Um, when people are being lynched, their Communist Party is out protesting against them. Um, so she literally says, I went to this movement and they were cognizant of what Garvey was speaking of. So I thought it'd be a good vehicle to help my people. And so really, if you think about the two major movements of black radicals from say, you know, 1920 to 1950, it really was, or even 1910, right? It really was the UNIA and the communist party. And she is somebody who found spaces in both of those movements to adhere to ideas of black nationalism, to adhere to ideas of black self-determination um, and to just organize on a daily basis to help black working class people. And coincidentally, it's when she starts to become a kind of working member of the communist party, she rises up in the ranks in Harlem. That's when her FBI st file starts. Yes, absolutely. And so, you talked a little bit about early 20th century radical organizing. So as we move forward in history just a bit, how did she keep radical politics alive when the nation really was turning towards integration in the mid 20th century? Yeah, so as the story, uh, many of you know, by the time we get to World War II, it, it is not popular to critique the nation state, right? Um, and it is, um, you kind of have to back away from some of the critiques of capitalism and move towards what we would call a popular front or kind of a liberal progressive organizing. She's a big time organizer there, um, but still keeps focusing on two things, even as she's organizing for the war, which was self-determination and self-defense for Black people. She continually defends those who have been charged with self-defense, including Black men and women, and she tries to always move kind of war resources, war conversations into control of communities by Black people. Eventually, then we get to the 1950s, where it is obviously immensely unpopular, unpopular to be a communist because we get the start of the Red Scare. Right? Um, and I think she sees the writing on the wall. Um, she was in New York when she was organizing with the Communist Party, and she goes back home to Louisiana. And I think this was an effort to lay low, kind of get off the radar. But it's also a moment where she's working with what we would call kind of the grassroots level or the lower frequencies to keep Garveyism and Black nationalism alive. So she starts a group called the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women. And you can see the, the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. You can see what she's doing there. Um, and it's in this particular group that she argues, she brings back the idea of, of a separate nation for Black people. And she also organizes on behalf of everyday people and she starts the reparations movement. Um, so I want you to think about this as being juxtaposed to the same moment that um, say the bus boycott is happening, 
right? Or um, desegregation struggles are starting. And so in a moment when probably more and more Black people are thinking integration is viable, and that's a reasonable thing to think, and becoming more mainstream, Moore is avidly against it. She's avidly against the Mars on Washington. And she's really still promoting um, not integration or entry into the American nation state, but separation in Black-led and defended communities. Wow. She is just this hardcore organizer in so many ways, shapes, and forms. And to think about her in this, this time period of history uh, and the work that she's doing, can you tell us about the relationship what her relationship was with some of the black power luminaries such as Malcolm X or Robert F. Williams. And even tell us a little bit more about some of those, those luminaries. Yeah, so if, you know, she's organizing in the 20s, 30s, um, in the 40s, 50s, early 60s, like I said, when maybe this nationalist moment goes out of style, she's still keeping the flame alive. And then as many of us know, by the mid 60s to early 70s, black nationalism and black power are making a resurgence um, in some part because of the limited gains of integration, but also because people like Moore have been advocating for it all the time. They never stopped. Right. It wasn't this either or. Um, so a lot of the folks that have been um, considered the leaders of this period of what we would call the Black Power Movement or the Black Power Era, one is Malcolm X, who we all know. Um, I've talked to many people who say that um, Malcolm would come and learn at her feet. She, For a time, she lived in Philadelphia, um, and he was organizing in Philadelphia and New York. And he, I, I've talked to many people who would come, say he would come by her house and learn about the organizing of the early 20th century. And she personally credits herself with helping him expand his view. She was always very critical of Elijah Muhammad. She was very critical of the nation of Islam. And she always, with her Garveyite kind of leanings, wanted him to think about, you know, a diaspora of Black people, not just Black people in the United States. Um, so she would say that she, in those conversations, um, um, kind of pushed him along that way. I'll say that, you know, we can kind of go back and forth. We may never know the extent of it, but I was looking at um, Malcolm X's papers in the Schomburg um, recently and her address in Philadelphia and her address in New Orleans are both listed in his address book. So I think that, you know, there is, you know, reason to believe that he was, you know, in communication and in conversation with her. Um, another great um, figure from this period is Robert F. Williams, who organized with the NAACP in North Carolina and was actually kicked out for his support of self-defense. He eventually um, becomes, as he moves into exile, he was fleeing charges um, of kidnapping that were not true, um, becomes kind of a Black power icon, somebody that is um, friendly with Fidel Castro, somebody that goes to China and really advocates for a full-on revolution for Black people in America. We have lots of evidence of correspondence between him and Queen Mother Moore, particularly when he was in exile, um, talking about which way the movement should go, what people should be studying, what kind of plans they should be making for advocating for reparations, for Black separation, etc. So I bring this all up to say... Um, at this point, you know, if we're talking about the 60s or 70s, remember I told you Moore was born at the end of the 19th century. She's actually in her 60s or 70s. Um, and this is where she gets this name of kind of being the queen mother of the movement. She's now an elder by the later 20th century. And younger revolutionaries and radicals are talking to her because she knows how to sustain a movement and because she's well-read and literate in, you know, political organizing. Wow, this is such fascinating history. And, and you said something at the end that I, I would love for you to quickly expand upon before we go into breakout rooms. So could you tell us even more about why Moore is considered the mother of the modern reparations movement? Yeah, so um, the reparations movement as we know it, or, or how we think about Black people and reparations is, is really a movement driven by Black working class women. Um, its first iteration, I would argue to you, was right after the Civil War when a woman from Cali House from um, Rutherford County, Tennessee, not too far actually from where I grew up, um, uh, started a movement to get pensions for ex-slaves, right? So payment from the government for the work that they did in the past. 
Um, she was caught up on mail fraud charges, as the government is wont to do, if you see a theme here. <laughs> um, and the movement kind of died out for a while. But it was more in the late 50s and early 1960s who resurrected this kind of organizing, this grassroots organizing, to file a claim with the American government for reparations. Um, so certainly there were people that were still doing it, but she was the one that kind of started a grassroots movement that took hold in sectors across the country. Um, so she was, she says that she did not know of House that she found a, a kind of religious saying that's saying that people needed to appeal for their captors within 100 years. So if you think about 1865 being the end of the Civil War, she was saying by 1965, Black people needed to make this appeal to the captors. Um, but in reality, what it really is happening here is she's using that as the basis to get people on board with a sense of urgency about filing a claim for such a thing. Um, and I wanna reiterate that at the time, this seemed incredibly fringe, but she got people on board with filing claims all across the country and organizations and lawyers incorporating across the country. She would go on a tour talking about this um, in order to um, get people to think about reparations. And one of the things that I think is really um, great about her approach is um, one, she was, willing to appeal to the US government. She thought you know, money was owed, but it was not just for black people to continue on their lives as usual. She wanted to use that money as the basis of a separate claim for a separate community or a separate nation state. Um, so you see this kind of interesting um, strategy of simultaneously critiquing the American government, but also you know, appealing to them for that. Um, and most people that you that you talk to in the 60s, 70s, 80s, including some of these Black power luminaries that I'm talking about, really credit oddly more with being the person that first kind of kept pushing this idea um, before it was popular um, and part of popular parlance. Wow. Oh, this history is so fascinating. And I had actually learned about Callie House from another Teach the Black Freedom Struggle class that we had with Dana Ramey Berry and Kelly Nicole Gross when we did our session on a Black woman's history of the United States. So we're going to take a pause now for our breakout rooms. And so now I'd like to welcome back Dr. Farmer as well as Dr. Jean Theo Harris so we can collectively celebrate the documentary that's coming out in just two days on Peacock. And Jean is actually going to talk to Ashley about the intersections of Queen Mother Moore uh, and Mrs. Rosa Parks. And I just want to mention a couple of things that the documentary has already been nominated for Best Bi Biographical Documentary for the 2022 Critics' Choice Documentary Awards. And today, Jean was on Doc Democracy Now! to talk more about the film. So, so excited about not only the film, but the lessons that will accompany it and all of the ways that we can bring this learning and, and your work, Jean, to the classroom. So I'll pass it over to you to continue the conversation. Um, so first, thank you so much, Tierra, And um, just like all this love, it is so nice to be together tonight. Um, in this week that the film is coming out, because in many ways, I think many of you have been with us on this journey and with me on this journey um, about Rosa Parks. And probably the thing I am most excited about is we have developed this whole curriculum suite um, around the film to, as as like Sierra and Jesse and I like to call Rosa Parks. She's sort of a Trojan horse for teaching a lot of different things, right? And so the lessons really allow people to go in a lot of different directions. And so um, Sierra, Kayla Jones, Jesse Agopian, Tiffany Patterson, Jessica Rucker, Ursula Wolfroka and Say Bergen all helped with the lessons. And then Deborah and Bill and Zinn are like really putting them into the world. And so it's just such, it's so exciting and so beautiful. And um, yeah. But as all of you know, I can relate everything to Rosa Parks. But in fact, there is an incredible relationship, a decades long relationship between Rosa Parks and Queen Mother Moore. And so we thought it would be a nice segue back to Queen Mother Moore because it's a super interesting 
and and sort of when I was first researching, really unexpected for me when Queen Mother Moore starts to pop up in places in Rosa Parks's life, and then I realized that they are their friends, and people would say, "Oh yeah, they used to sit in the front row together," you know. They were here sitting in the front row together. They were there sitting in the front row together. And I was like, whoa. And then I think Ashley knows a lot more even than I was able to figure out. So back to you, Ashley. There we go. Um, yeah, so um, I think that um, I think I'll highlight two moments that I think really encapsulate kind of the longevity of Parks and Moore's relationship. Um, one is if you look on the Library of Congress website, you will f and you put in Rosa Parks papers, um, you will find um, a letter from Queen Mother Moore to Rosa Parks um, about that organization I was telling you about, the Universal Association of Ethiopian Women. Um, the group that was started in the late 50s, early 60s, that was advocating for reparations and separation. And um, she's really interested in getting Parks on board um, with supporting the organization and in particular reparations, um, which I think is really interesting because everything I um, have told you kind of suggests, if you believe the narratives, right, that we talked about at the beginning of our session is that, you know, Parks is on the integrationist path, you know, Queen Mother Moore is on this Black nationalist path, none between will meet. Um, but as Jean has taught us, Parks was a far more, um, you know, dynamic and politically interesting um, an expansive figure than we've ever really been told. Um, and her and Moore found lots of points of congruence. Um, another is when they would go to the Black Power conferences together. Um, you know, Queen Mother Moore again was an elder by the 1960s. It's a series of conferences that took place between about 66 and 68, where people were trying to think about forming separate Black political parties, um, separate Black nations, perhaps. Um, and there you could, the stories go that like, if you were in the hallway, you saw Queen Mother Moore in like her regalia um, telling you to reparations, reparations, reparations. And you would often see Parks beside her or sitting beside her um, at these events. And then um, I mentioned to you that um, Moore was active until the late 1990s. Her last public appearance was at the Million Man March in 1996. Um, and uh, Parks was there as well. There's actually this section of the um, program, the Mothers of the Movement, and there they have, you know, Dorothy Height, they've got Maya Angelou, they've got Betty Shabazz, Michael, I'm, I'm sorry, Michael, <laughs> Malcolm X's widow, and they've got Parks and um, uh, Queen Mother Moore. So that should tell you about um, how their lives are kind of intertwining, but also um, the ways in which they are respected figures in the movement. I often um, say if we if we want to talk in traffic in those narratives, like we would think of Rosa Parks as birthing a modern civil rights movement, you should think of Queen Mother Moore as kind of midwifing a modern Black nationalist movement in that way. Wow, that's so fascinating to hear the intersections. And I see Jean's comment in the chat that they literally sat next to each other in so many spaces and, and to see how they converge in that way with their, their ideas and, and their orientation to the work. And, and so you, you mentioned Black nationalism. So how does Moore challenge our traditional understandings of Black nationalism? Um, yeah, so, you know, at, at Black nationalism um, as a political philosophy, we're talking about the idea of Black people um, being able to exercise community control, um, self-determination, and self-defense, right? Um, and to what end? Some of that is for a actual physical place that would constitute a nation. Um, but more often than not, it's kind of a metaphysical or kind of figurative nation, this idea that Black people are bound together, even if we're not technically, um, you know, making claim to some land and within a geographical boundary. Right? Um, but if you have heard these things being advocated for, you've probably heard them being advocated for by Black men, right? Whether that be Marcus Garvey, whether that be Malcolm X, whether that be Robert Williams, like I told you about, right? Um, and so I think more really 
was a central architect of what we would think of as like 20th century Black nationalism, even though we only give that credit to the Garveys and the Malcolms, right, as I've explained to you. Um, but also, she really, by taking on this persona of Queen Mother, was really able to be in a lot of the central places where Black nationalism was being practiced and theorized. So what do I mean by that? Black nationalism, in some extent, in some ways, recapitulates, right, very standard gender norms, right? Men are the heads of the nation, women are kind of the mothers and the molders of the nation. Um, and so that would leave more out of a lot of the central kind of decision-making circles to which, you know, modern Black nationalism owes its stuff to. But what she did, basic, and then she's a lot older, right, than a lot of these folks as well, being born in the late 19th century. So by becoming a queen mother, right, all of a sudden she's an elder to be respected, and her advice is to be sought, right? And that makes it okay for her to be in these spaces with all male groups all the time, when normally that would not be seen as something that was okay for a woman. And it also, I think, helps Helps her stay relevant far past what people would be considering her organizing prime, right? When we think about organizing, we think of it wrongfully, but nonetheless, we think of it as a young person's game, right? Um, and so by, by continuing to be, kind of take on this elder um, position, she enables herself to stay present. So um, if you talk to organizers, you know, in the grassroots and especially in places like uh, Mississippi, they'll say, um, you know, Black nationalism is the child of Malcolm X and Queen Mother Moore, right? The political child of Malcolm X and Queen Mother Moore. And I think that is in fact the case. Wow. And we, we've talked a little bit about uh, Queen Mother Moore and the relationship to Malcolm X and some of the, the men of the movement. And I see a couple of questions in the chat box that I'll kind of pull together. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that in, in talking about Mrs. Rosa yeah. Parks, many people were sparked about other folks that they yeah. out too. And so folks in the chat are wondering about Queen Mother Moore's relationship with um, organizers like Angela Davis and mm -hmm. Ella Baker and Septima Clark. Great questions. Now, um, Ella Baker and her were well known to each other and moved in and out of circles together, particularly in Harlem um, with political organizing. Um, but um, I don't have as much evidence about the Septima Clark. Um, and who was the third? The just for sorry. Yeah, Angela Davis. Angela Davis, yeah. Um, or Angela Davis. So um, one of the things that is complicated about Moore is her gender politics. Um, and I think, and you know, she was also human. Um, and so I think that she did not, she was certainly in support of somebody like Angela Davis, right? And organized uh, for her release as a political prisoner as she did with many other political prisoners. But as I mentioned before, part of her ability to stay um, kind of relevant was dependent on her being sought after by Black male leaders. And so I don't think she forged as good of relationships with younger Black radicals um, because I think she kind of felt a little bit of a scarcity model in that sense. That also said, the young Black women did not love her because your girl, Queen Mother Moore, had, like I said, some problematic gender politics by every stretch of the matter, but she was who she was. Um, and that included um, promoting polygamy as a way to counteract and the, um, you know, uh, disparate rates between Black men and Black women and the mass incarceration of Black men. Um, and she bought in a lot of times to this kind of very masculinist, Black nationalist ideal, even as her she herself was flouting all of that, right? Like, it didn't apply to her, but it applied to all the other women, and particularly the young women. So if you talk to younger activists, particularly those that um, were organizing, say, in the 60s or 70s, like a Davis, um, they are um, appreciative of her struggle think that she was had a shrewd political acumen and organizing strategy, but found it difficult to kind of meet with her because she often they felt kind of taught down to them about and kind of tried to impose her gender politics on them. Um, so, you know, folks are human. And, <laughs> and that was that. Wow, that is so fascinating. Yeah. yeah. I, I appreciate you just naming that, right? That they're human, right? Every day. Yeah, yeah. I was like, every day yeah, day day. like you are, I mean, people can be very radical in some respects right. and very conservative in others, right? And that's a perfect right. example of where she's literally the first person to sign a declaration for a Black nation when tons of men sitting in the audience would not do it. But by that same token, she thinks that 
men should run that black nation and women should fall in line. It's, it's, she is on part of it, but everybody else has to follow the gender roles. Wow. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And oh, one connection I'm making in my mind about something that I read of yours. So you talk about Moore's reparation activism in particular, um, and, and these are your words, as revealing her commitment to a diverse uh, concept of a reparations movement that offered multiple entry points for activists across the political spectrum. So even with these, the, the problematic gender mm -hmm. politics, can you talk more about how she did this? Yeah, so um, we might think of reparations as um, symbolic in the sense that maybe it's an apology or maybe it's a monument or a testament to something. We might think of reparations as a payout, right, of um, either money owed from labor that was performed without funding or um, as retribution for a long period of sustained racial and psychological terror. Or you might think about reparations as um, programs put in place, like job programs or housing programs, to redistribute or help reinforce or level the playing field between Black people and white people after years of injustice, right? And then you might think of reparations as, um, you know, just an actual paycheck that people are able to do whatever they want with. I would say that over the course of her reparations activism, which we're talking, if she's starting to think about this in the late 50s, and I'm telling you she's passing away in the 90s, she's thinking about this for almost half a century. Her thinking about reparations and what it could look like evolves over time. And so um, if you drop down in different moments of her life, you will see her advocating for different ways of reparations. Some of that, like I said, is appealing for a payout. And sometimes in pamphlets, she's talking about government programs to level the playing field. At other moments, she is talking about, um, you know, acknowledgement from the American nation state of the wrongs done. But what that kind of diverse understanding of repayment and repair does is allow different people, different entry points into advocating for this cause, right? I think that's one of the things in which she was incredibly expansive and imaginative in that way. Right. Um, and so some folks maybe couldn't get on board with like, we're going to take the money and form a separate nation, but they could get on board with government programs that, you know, privileged or, you know, leveraged the playing field for jobs or schools or employment. Right. Um, or maybe they could get on board with saying, if you can trace your lineage, you should get a paycheck for that unpaid label of your ancestors. Um, so she I like to think of her as kind of a watering can, sprinkling water and letting the flowers of reparations bloom in all kinds of places. Um, so the folks in Philadelphia wanted a separate nation. The folks in you know L.A. were a bunch of lawyers that wanted the government to give a paycheck. Right. Um, and, and she was supportive and kind of the patron saint of all of those different ways of, of thinking about this. Wow. And it's interesting because it, it feels like she's going about kind of a narrative strategy where she is mm -hmm. knowing what audiences are mm -hmm. and then ultimately tailoring the message, but still mm -hmm. staying strong to mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. larger, she's seeing the larger picture of right. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. which I think is a really powerful blueprint for how we mm -hmm. might think about that kind of uh, organizing today. So I'm going to shift my questions a little bit because there's a question in the chat and I also have a couple of questions about related specifically to teaching. Mm -hmm. um, Sydney Stewart in the chat asks, what recommendations do you have for educators in lifting up Queen Mother Moore's contributions, but also as we've talked about the complexity uh, mm. in learning spaces? That's a great point. Um, I think that there's a couple of different ways um, that you could approach it. One would be, as we've taught before, um, offering a, a couple of pages from the FBI file. Um, it offers an opportunity for students just to see that dynamic in play, um, but also think about, you know, what it must be like um, to do this kind of work under the heavy weight of surveillance, which we don't talk about enough. Um, and um, separate from that, I think she has a wonderful pamphlet um, that you can get a scan from, um, from most libraries um, that is called Why Reparations. And it details her intellectual rationale for it. And then some of these programs that I'm talking about or I've referenced before. Um, so a great lesson plan would be um, for her to, um, for students to read through that and think through um, the reasoning of what she offers. One of the things that's really 
interesting about that particular pamphlet is that she references both, you know, American payouts to say those who were in Japanese internment camps, for example, but also other forms of reparations that have been played globally. So it's clear she has kind of a globally conscious mindset about it. Um, so thinking um, through, through that with students would be helpful in what reparations might look like in their communities as well, or if these programs seem feasible, why or why not. Um, and then I think um, that um, there are several oral histories that have been published of hers. And the oral histories are where you really get a sense of, of these gender politics. Um, they'll ask her things like, what is the role of women? And you will cringe <laughs> a little bit at, at, the, at the responses that she gives. Um, one of them is published in a journal called The Black Scholar, for example. Um, and, and so, um, you know, in one part of the interview, she'll be offering this wonderful assessment like of, of reparations or, or um, you know, kind of racial terror and the American nation state. The next thing she'll be like, husbands for five women, right? And so, <laughs> um, you know, you might just ask students to read through that and say, you know, how, how, how do we understand this person? You know, where would you, if we had to kind of make a graph or, um, you know, a, a kind of plot of politics at this particular moment, what things will we consider, you know, kind of reformist, radical, revolutionary, conservative? And, and what does that tell me, tell us about the complexities of people as human beings? Oh, I love that so much. The complexity of who we are as human beings. And one thing that you lift up in a lot of your work just is, is how people evolve over time, yes. how yeah. organizers and activists have, have changed their politics. And one thing that you uh, wrote that I, I read, uh, you had said, you know, we don't wake up woke, right? We, we develop those politics over time. And so I just appreciate you lifting that up as a teaching strategy, right? To explore what that might look like in the, in the classroom, for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it, it, if we frame it as, you know, again, I think this is something that in particular Jean does very well, if we kind of strip away these narratives of heroism mm -hmm. and talk about people that we know in history as just people that looked around them and made a set of choices, and those choices, you know, had big reverberations, but nonetheless, they were regular people presented with a set of choices and they made the choice that they thought was the best at that moment. Um, it helps us see ourselves less a little bit as people that have to be kind of these martyrs for a movement and just say everybody has a set of choices and we can try to, you know, just move the way that we want to see the world go, right? Um, and sometimes people have missteps. Um, everybody evolves, right? I always tell my students, like, I tell them, I don't know what the opposite of canceled is. I call it being rescheduled, but I know that's, I know that's not right, but I don't have a better word for it. But, but like, you know, I mean, you know, more would be canceled for her for those kind of politics now, right? Um, so everything is also really historically specific. Um, so, you know, we need to to make sure that we understand people as evolving in their politics, but also um, understanding that they may they may be reacting to different things in their different times. Um, and you know, instead of condemning somebody, think you know what about their life makes them think that's the right thing to espouse. You know, Queen Mother Moore. When I'm talking about the gender politics and how she didn't gel with younger activists, I mean, she's almost 80 years older than them, right? It was a whole different world in which she came of age, and so that doesn't mean that she doesn't have to adapt or that she should not be critiqued, but it helps us provide insight as to why, you know, maybe comparing her with somebody that is, you know, coming of age in a feminist movement might <laughs> look a little bit different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and speaking of evolving, as we're also talking about teaching strategies, um, one thing that I read about your teaching is that you do a freedom reflection exercise in your class. Um, and I found the, the questions that you use to be really thought provoking, provoking um, and might be really helpful for so many of the educators on this call. So could you talk to us a little bit more about the freedom exercise? Sure. Um, so I teach here in Texas, which um, as many of you can probably attest to is a wild time to teach Black history in Texas. Um, but um, I teach a, a big intro to African-American history class. You know, we're talking 100 plus students, right? Um, and a lot of them, um, because of the standards of Texas history, 
have never had a whole kind of um, understanding of black history. Um, and they're mostly in my class because the school requires them to take two semesters of US history, two semesters of Texas history. So this is their US history requirement. So I set that as the basis to say that um, many of them come with, with very little knowledge of African-American history from the start, right? Um, and I believe though, I am not, te they have a textbook, right? There's nothing that I am um, teaching them that they really can't learn in other books and online, right? The value of the classroom is that we come together to discuss it and we hear each other's perspectives and points of view. Um, and also to think about once we assimilate knowledge, how we might behave differently because of it, right? Um, so at the very beginning of the class, I have them write a reflection on, on that asks them three things, to, to rate their knowledge of African-American history on a scale of one to 10. Um, two, to think about what they think is the biggest problem, like basically facing Black people today and what that stems from historically. And then kind of three, what do they think would solve that? Then we go from, we're talking like the 1400s all the way to like Trayvon Martin in one semester. It's quite the odyssey, right? And then at the end, I ask them to reassess their knowledge of African-American history because we all know they need to be told that they learned things, right? Because they'll swear they didn't otherwise. <laughs> um, so that I ask them, um, do they still believe that the thing that they thought was historically the problem, like kind of the root of racial oppression is the same? But then the third thing that I always ask them to do is say, now that you know, now that you've had the privilege to sit and examine this for a whole semester, how will you behave differently? One, on an individual level, two, on a communal level, and like in kind of a family communal level, and then three, on our campus level. And I'm not asking for, you know, huge acts, you know, I'm not asking you to always stage a protest, but what I'm emphasizing is that it is okay that you did not know. That is why we're here. There's no better place to not know something than to come into a classroom. That's exactly, I. it is my job to teach you this, right? People always say, it's not my job. It actually is my job. But once you know, you have a responsibility to those around you to use that knowledge to move differently through the world. And so I'm less concerned with whether they know, you know, every little amendment and every little year, but I am interested in them walking away with an ability to see and empathize with the Black experience differently and try to make adjustments in their lives that make it move towards a community that is more caring and empathetic, right? Um, so that's the goal. Um, and um, usually the, their their historical thing that they think was the root of oppression is quite different, um, which is a testament to them kind of rethinking in that way. Um, but sometimes they're just um, simple things. They'll say things like, when I hear everybody sitting around in the dorm room and they start talking about Black people in this way, I'll intervene and just say, you know, actually, it's really harmful and that perpetuates a stereotype, right? Or some of them say, you know, um, I, I'm going to, you know, share some of these sources and read them with my parents who I know have no idea what's going on. And I think, you know, they're shaping those things, right? So, um, you know, some of them make bolder proclamations, but I find the ones where they just are willing to make kind of, or at least, you know, say they're going to make a slight adjustment and think about their awareness of the world around them differently to be, you know, incredibly rewarding. That's so moving. Just a reminder of how the classroom is this site of, of possibility, but a site of action, a site of evolution and experimentation and exploration of the history and mm -hmm. also of ourselves and what our role ultimately is in the history that we make every day. So I have one final question that will kind of bring us to the current moment um, and hopefully we'll, we'll tie all of the pieces together. But Right now, of course, we're seeing in, in 42 states and counting that there's legislation banning critical conversations about racism and oppression in schools. And so with the history of Queen Mother Moore, thinking about conversations about reparations, thinking about conversations around black nationalism, all of that, right, in many places cannot be taught. So what are your thoughts on the attacks on teaching the truth about United States history? And how do they relate to many of the stories that we talked about tonight? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm right there with you. I think there's a bill to come and I think audit every class that takes CRT and tenure anybody that teaches it. 
um, at UT that is going to be voted on in the next week. So um, it is it is it is an interesting time to be sure, right? Um, and so um, you know, I would say a couple of things. I think one of the things that Queen Mother teaches me is that. Um, this isn't new, and I take comfort in that, right? Because if, when you realize that it's not new, that people have been through it before and endured it before, um, you kind of know that that we'll still be here in the end doing what it is that we do, right? Um, and and I think, so that's just lesson one, right? She she was certainly under attack in for her beliefs and her teachings, um, and she kept on keeping on, and, and she endured it, right? And is now being heralded, right? And getting biographies written about her. That's one. Um, two, I think that um, these fo folks that have traditionally had to address these subjects outside of formal institutions have offered us a little bit of a roadmap. And to me, that is freedom schools, um, and, you know, not unlike what we're doing now. And um, what will we may have to do for our students, I'm not suggesting that we don't continue to fight these bills as they come down the line, but um, that does not mean that we have to wholesale stop talking about it. We may just have to shift the venues with which we talk about it. Um, but one thing that um, teaching students in a state where they're actively trying to do this has taught me is that the students really do have a real appetite for it. And if you build it, I do think that they will come. Um, so I think we have to all rely on our networks um, to continue to try to do that as much as possible. Um, and we also have to keep having community, right? I mean, par part, of, part of what this is about, I mean, they don't really they don't even know what they're saying, right? And nor do I think they really actually care. Um, it's just they want somebody to glom onto, right? As as a, as a, to be kind of the target of this. Um, and so, you know, we need to make sure that we stay in community with one another, um, that we understand that that's what it is, and not to get, um, you know, distracted from that. And if we see folks that we care about in our community becoming the target of that, be ready to, you know, support and stand up for them as much as possible. Um, in that case, but you know, we we will we will get through this, is what I would say. And um, you know, as people have done it before, and we know that it's so scary for exactly the same reason that we talked about when we got on today. It's because what happens when our students know the truth, right? They're afraid of how they might behave differently. They're afraid of that they won't be able to have the same level of power and keep people entranced by these kind of Disney-like narratives of what the history is versus what it actually is. So as much as we can continue to push that and empower our students to say that the truth really is a path to the different world, then I think that you know we're on the right path and we'll be okay. But in the meantime, I wanna emphasize that it also sucks because I look at, I, you know, I mean, like, I, I don't want, I don't want to downplay people's real experience with this, right? Like, people will be okay, right? Like, I may or may not be targeted, right? But I, you know, I will be okay. But there, there is real trauma involved sometimes in becoming the target of these things, right? In the process, and so I don't, I want to reassure people that there is community and that they are on the right side and doing the right thing, without also saying that, you know. Um, when you become the target of some of these things, it can be scary for a time, right? Um, and and I don't want to minimize people's experiences, even while saying that I don't think in the end, you know, it will be all right. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And solidarity to all of the educators, all the librarians, the organizers, the activists, the family members, the students, everyone who is on this call um, that continues to teach truth and to seek truth and continues to promote the truth, because we know that this is this is our path to freedom. It's our path to liberation. And so I want to end with a quote, uh, a quote from your writing. Uh, and, and I think that it will hopefully tie together this conversation and bringing together Queen Mother more, but also thinking about learning the history so that we can dream new futures. And so in your words, Dr. Farmer, you said Queen Mother Moore certainly meant that African-Americans deserved and should demand repayment. But her larger message and her contribution to the Black freedom movement was to show that through a reparations movement, organizers could reckon with each other and their troubled past as well as chart a course toward a collective self-determining and self-governing future. And so with that, I wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. 